This is EHJ Today. We're in Davos at Cardiology Update, and with me is Professor Jonathan D Deanfield from London. We're going to be chatting about cardiovascular risk and a few related topics. John, can you distinguish the way we used to treat people based on risk factors versus 10-year risk versus now the concept of lifetime risk? Why, why do we need to uh, evolve our thinking? You're right, Salim. There has been a change in our thinking about atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease because despite all of our efforts, this does remain the biggest challenge we have in medicine in terms of global impact on morbidity and mortality. So we cannot be complacent. Now, traditionally, we've been, as doctors, we've been waiting for patients to come to us with clinical problems. And we've done spectacularly well in their management and really made a difference to their future risk. So we have interventional procedures, we have secondary prevention treatments, which have made a real impact on the outlook for those patients. But we're still left with a disease that remains top of the list for the population. And perhaps what we haven't done that well is to try to prevent the disease in its long preclinical phase. So the concept is emerging that not only should we be managing patients better, but actually trying to look in a global way at the risk factors that are driving atherosclerosis and start to think about what we might do in the preclinical phase to sto stop or reduce the evolution of atherosclerosis and therefore make a difference to their future health. Now, uh, what would, how would that differ from taking somebody with high blood pressure and just treating that or taking somebody with high cholesterol and treating that? So what you're saying, is it the same or is it something different? We are very fortunate in understanding some of the major risk factors that are driving atherosclerosis, which has become, we have become targets for our intervention. Your own study, the InterHeart study, really helped us understand the causal relationship between modifiable risk factors and future events, giving us targets for treatment. And you also showed in that study very clearly that it isn't a one risk factor. There are multiple risk factors often operating together that need to be targeted. So lowering risk factors and broadening our approach has been a clear message from that. What I'm suggesting is that perhaps we ought to be thinking about early intervention and trying to understand what we should be doing to alter the risk profile exposure over many years for the public to try to stop the evolution to clinical atherosclerosis. So I would argue that it is lower risk factors, it is broad management of risk factors, and perhaps an attention to the global risk factor profile from an earlier stage that will become part of our approach to atherosclerosis reduction. So let's talk about the early stage, but the concept of lifetime risk is that risk accumulates over decades. So how early should we start to intervene? And if so, how early with lifestyle and how early with drugs or or you don't make a distinction? So actually the concept, Salim, is rather easy. We know that the pathology of atherosclerosis actually begins in the first two decades of life and often in children. So the disease is initiated and progressing from a remarkably early stage, long before we see it in clinical practice, which usually occurs after 50. Mm -hmm. So there's a period of 50 years when the disease is developing and what's becoming clear from recent evidence that it is exposure to the classic cardiovascular risk factors, cholesterol, smoking, blood pressure, and the like, that is very important in driving the evolution of that preclinical disease. So the idea that we can prevent the disease or slow its progression by doing something about the risk factors early is gaining traction from recent evidence. So not only do we wait for patients who have high levels of risk factors close to when their events are scheduled to happen, but try to do something early. And a lot of that, you're absolutely right, could be around educating the public and empowering them to take control of their own cardiovascular risk. So let's take um, somebody uh, in their teens or early adulthood. Uh, how would we go about improving their lifetime risk? Well, some of these questions are around patient care and some of them are around public health policy. And right. we're really straying into that area. And I believe that the medical profession needs to stray into that area of trying to look at the way in which we target behavior in the population. So school meals, school exercise programs, targeting obesity in the young, 
big time bomb for future cardiovascular and disease. And avoiding smoking. And avoiding smoking. Those are absolutely crucial steps at a public health level that we ought to be supporting and in fact pushing very hard to the politicians and our healthcare providers. So if we get people to follow the right diet and be active when they're young, uh, keep their weight down and not smoke, how, you know, what proportion of premature heart attacks and strokes can we prevent? Well, there's been some recent very provocative genetic data right. to suggest that if you had good genes for blood pressure and good genes for cholesterol, so that you reduced your cholesterol and blood pressure levels quite modestly, but you did it over your lifetime, you might have the opportunity to reduce cardiovascular events later on by between 50 and 90 percent. Huge impact. And it's a little bit like saving, Salim. Right. We all know about starting to save for our retirement early on and compound interest. Health and wealth are actually not too dissimilar. The concept of doing something early, even a modest reduction for many years if you sustain it, producing a leveraged gain, is now becoming a clear option for us in terms of healthcare Let management. Let me ask you a pressing question. We all agree tobacco smoking is not good, exercise is good, but what about diet? Every day we see a different message. So what do you think uh, would be a healthy diet? Well, I'm not perhaps the perfect person to answer that question. And there is, as you know, an intense debate around diet. If you looked as an objective outsider at what we've achieved in the last 30 years, you wouldn't be very impressed and what we have done in terms of dietary advice to the health and the weight of the population. We've seen an explosion in obesity, and perhaps we have to relook at the advice we've been giving people about what isn't a healthy diet and what is a healthy diet. I think we've concentrated on low fat inappropriately, and we've missed a trick in terms of carbohydrate reduction. And in fact, many of the foods we've advised that are low in fat are actually very high in sugar. So perhaps we've got the emphasis wrong and we need to rethink our advice for the population. But we can all agree if eating plenty of fruits and perhaps vegetables is good for, for people and that should be something encouraged from school, yes, school days. We've known about this from the diets and cardiovascular risk in countries. The Mediterranean diet comes up regularly. The Mediterranean diet is perhaps not what we've always thought. It isn't a particularly low fat diet, but it does encourage a broad range of nutrients and particularly fruit, vegetables and um, appropriate levels, dare I say, of sugar and carbohydrates. So what you're suggesting is lots of fruits and vegetables, a balanced diet, moderation, and don't go crazy about reducing fat and don't eat too much carbohydrates and certainly not uh, sweetened right. sugar beverage. I think there's no doubt that that is a healthier diet. One has to distinguish between a weight loss diet right. and a chronic healthy diet as well. If you want to lose weight rapidly, and many of us need to do that, then lowering the carbohydrate dramatically seems to be the most effective way at achieving a weight loss, but not necessarily as a way of producing chronic health uh, with that sort of diet. So I think we need to have a healthy diet and we need to have a diet that takes many of our patients who come to us very obese and tries to get them back to where they ought to be. Well, thank you, John. That's very enlightening. And thank you for doing this interview. And uh, good luck with your continued work in the field. Thank you. Thank you.